Hey guys, welcome to this week's episode of Tracy's Tuesday Talks. I am your hostess of Golden Rush Financial Coaching, Tracy Latona, where I guide growth-minded people who are stressed and anxious about finances to conquer their financial goals. I have with me today an, a very, very special guest, Jasmine Paul, whom I am just stupid excited to have with me today. And today's topic is going to be about kids and finances. Jasmine Paul is a published author. She writes uh, kiddos books on, on finances called the Wealth Playground series. So Jasmine, thanks so much for joining me today. Tell me a little bit about you and your story and what led you to write these books. Hi, Tracy. Thanks so much for having me. It's such an opportunity to share with you and your audience um, about financial literacy and a little bit about my journey. So thank you so much. Um, so hello, everyone. I'm Jasmine Paul. I am a certified financial educator instructor, as well as an active duty finance officer in the military. Um, and what kind of led me down this journey, I feel like we have to kind of start from the beginning, um, kind of learning about money. So I'm first generation American. My parents uh, came to the US when they were in their 20s and late teens. And um, in the Caribbean, it's kind of taboo to talk about money. In many other households, it's throughout the US, taboo to talk about money. And so I feel like my parents and my grandparents did a great job of sharing financial literacy, not necessarily talking about it, but showing me through their example. So my grandmother was a seamstress. She had her own business for over 40 years now. And she took me to the local credit union to open up my first banking account as a child. I remember us going through the drive through and us like, you know, the little shoot of the little tube um, and like her actually writing out, you know, um, whatever the statement was that whatever the transaction was. But I do recall those memories. Um, and I feel like, yeah, just throughout the way, my parents kind of guided me. I kind of lost my way a little bit when I was in college. I ended up getting a student loan. Um, I was really good about credit cards because my dad was like, you will only use this card for emergencies. And I think I only had like a 500 limit anyways, $500 limit. Um, and so I feel like he was like, do not use this credit card. for <laughs> Wise words. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm glad he taught me that because I didn't, I didn't use, I didn't get into credit card debt in college, but I did have student loan debt and I was not very good at managing my money. Um, I knew how to work. I knew how to earn money. And that was something I've learned since I was a young child. Um, but I didn't necessarily know how to manage and save it or invest it and grow it. Um, and so when I graduated college, um, before I graduated college, I found myself uh, living in my car and on friends' couches because I didn't know how to manage money. And I promised myself once I graduated commission into the military that I would learn more so I was reading books um, from the library. Like it was like the summer before I went on to active duty. I was like just learning as much as I could about like saving, investing. Um, and then I remember I got my first apartment after college. I had two roommates living in California. Um, my rent was $400 um, <laughs> all in, which was awesome in Cali, like amazing. <laughs> But I was able to save like 60% of my income because I only had, you know, I was just only using, utilizing 400 for um, my living expenses. And so that kind of gave me like the courage to like, okay, you got this. Like you can save 60%, like you can keep doing this. Um, and of course my situations changed. I didn't have the roommates uh, forever. Um, but yeah, it just kind of continued on. And then I started my friend's uh got wind of me paying off my student loans by the time I was 24, buying my first property at 23. And they were like, okay, you're doing this. How are you doing this? We don't make that much money. <laughs> right. <laughs> What's the secret? Um, and so, yeah, it just kind of grew from there. That's incredible. So just having that influence, having just, just observing, like, so by the time that we are ages two to three, our subconscious decides whether or not, bless you, the world is safe or not. And by the age of four, our subconscious solidifies whether or not money is safe or not. Yeah. So 
you just had those examples and were like, oh, well, these people seem to know what they're doing. And you were able to carry on that legacy of your grandma to your friends because they saw you doing things well and were like, oh, give me a piece of that. I want that. That's awesome. Yeah. And I will say my dad, um, there was at the time Visa had a program called the Visa Bucks card. And that was a program specifically for, I think like the preteen age, um, kind of like today's like green light program. And I feel like that was a really great introduction to learning about like debit cards and learning when you don't have any money, you can't swipe it. Um, I learned that lesson, but it was, it was nice to have like this controlled environment of being able to spend uh, for the things that I really want, but also kind of have my dad monitoring my statements and, and what I was doing. And once that money ran out, the money was gone. So I couldn't, couldn't do anything else. <laughs> Love that. So you had a safety net around you of learning how to manage your money, being able to make your mistakes and then having like those boundaries of dude, once it's gone, like it's gone. So, so I'm going to ask you a question. Yeah. Once that money was gone, did you ever ask your dad for more money? Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> did he give it to you? Um, I don't think so. I think, I don't think so. Cause I used it. I would put my, um, money that I earned through my jobs. I like, I've been working since I was like 13 years old. I don't know if that was, you know, the greatest thing, but I was doing like side jobs. I was a DJ for, um, an events, uh, events center. And so I was doing like little kids parties, but I learned how to DJ. They taught me how, um, and I would be like the hype person, just like, yeah. And like little kids. <laughs> I love that. I see that for you. <laughs> like they're like six and seven, like, just like, what? <laughs> like <laughs> listening to kids bop or something. But, um, so I, I would put like my side money on it. Um, and then he would put, you know, like a monthly allowance on it. But, um, yeah, if it was not within the month of like renewal, like if he had already renewed it and I used the money, then no, he wouldn't. Yeah. but it was like hey I'm trying to do this whatever and he he thought that it was I guess worthy for him to you know add some extra money to it then he would but for the most part my dad was like pretty strict about like you don't just like I'm not like this bank that you can just yeah. walk up to and get money from right what what lesson do you think that taught you that carried into adulthood um one I think it taught me I had to work like that was, yeah, I, I did not ever look to my parents for help. And I think that's what landed me into my situation, my senior year, because I was so adamant on figuring it out myself. Um, although I will say my parents did help me, my, both my mom and my dad helped me throughout college. I am very grateful for them. Um, my mom helped me with like rent, (laughs) uh, my junior year. And so, and throughout just college, my dad helped me with summer classes and different things like that. But um, I think I was always determined to figure it out myself. I love to work. It was enjoyable for me, especially if it was something that I actually enjoyed. Um, I knew how to make money. And so I think for me, it just showed me that, yeah, like there wasn't really someone that I could really ask for help. I just had to figure it out myself. And then hindsight, I did have this community of people who would have absolutely helped me out. Um, But I think for me, it kind of showed me like, you can figure it out. It might be a little bumpy along the road. It might not be the greatest experience. Um, But for me, it was, yeah, like you can definitely figure this out. Might be a little hard, but you can figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. So that kind of transitions right into one of the points that you wanted to touch on was you get to rewrite your story no matter where you're at. Absolutely. Yes, I think it's important. I think um, when I speak to people about personal finances, um, a lot of people are stuck in kind of they've been living in a cycle of paycheck to paycheck. Um, Either they have some financial trauma with their experiences throughout their childhood or even into adulthood. Um, And that, you know, like, well, I'm such a, I'm so bad with money. I can never be good with money. And I think for me, it's you, if you have an opportunity to wake up tomorrow 
and you have breath in your lungs and you have, you know, abilities and skills and gifts that were given to you, um, that you have an opportunity to change your money story. And I don't think, yeah, I don't think it's over until it's over. You know what I mean? Like you can always switch it up. You can always, um, figure it, figure out something new for you. And I will say like the things that I did back when I was in my twenties are not things that I necessarily do in my thirties. Like I, I wish I could save at a 60% savings rate. I cannot like inflation is real. The economy is real. Like I don't have roommates. Um, like I did back then rent is ridiculous. Like mortgages are ridiculous. You know, like things are not as affordable as they were back then. I also didn't have all like the responsibilities that I do now in my thirties versus in my twenties. And so, um, I have to rewrite a new money story, right? Like when you lose a job, you have to rewrite a new money story. If you have, you add a family member to your house, whether that be a child or whether that be an adult, a parent, um, you know, your caregiving, whatever, like you have to rewrite the story and uh, it's not over until it's over. Like you can absolutely push to the goals that you desire. Preach it, sister. Mm, we are on this, a very similar, if not the same mission. I love it. I love it. I love it. So what led you to write books that were aimed for kids on personal finance? Yeah. So, um, I started talking about personal finance again with my friends. They started, uh, becoming debt free. Um, and then I know it's, it was awesome. Um, and then I started doing workshops. I was really targeting at the time, um, adults, adults between the ages of like 25 and 40 who were kind of at a place where they just had given up hope. They've tried different services. They've tried different courses and workshops and nothing had seemed to help. And so those were who, those were the people I was, who I was targeting at the time. Um, and then the pandemic hits and I'm like, wow, I felt like my family and I were talking a lot more about money. We were having conversations about the stock market we were having conversations about retirement, um, wills, trusts, I mean, saving everything. And so my my sister kind of like, kind of sparked this idea because we were talking more about money. I, I talked to her more about money than I'd ever, I feel like we ever had in the her entire adulthood or childhood. Um, she was in her senior year of college, or sorry, of high school. And I was like, wow, like we're having these really great conversations. I wonder if parents are having these conversations with their kiddos. Um, and then I started doing some market research and I was like, oh my gosh, like there's such a great market for kids books, like kids books that are easy, that are not complex, that will share like a cool, unique story, but will also teach um, the basics about money. And so that's kind of where that my first book, A Boy, A Budget, and a Dream was birthed. Amazing. So what age are your books geared towards? Yes. Ages five to nine. Ah, oh, that's like that perfect age. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. So yeah. I know when it comes to, well, can, can, can I like ask you, can you like give a preview, a brief preview of that first book? Yeah, for sure. I can actually show you if that's okay. That would be awesome. So everyone can see what it looks like and be like, yep, that's it. Amazon cart right now. <laughs> so I actually have an Easter basket that I created for the weekend. I don't know if you can see it. Wait, I probably Not need to. Un yet. Okay, let me unblur it. I see the basket and I see <laughs> cellophane wrap. <laughs> there it is. <gasps> That's cute. It's like a little basket um, for, I did a book festival this weekend for Easter. Um so, I will show you a boy, a budget, and a dream, just so you can see it. That's the book. Oh, I love that. Um, and so this book was, it was inspired by my godchild. So I have no children of my own yet. Um, but it was inspired by my godson um, because I wanted, I just, I was looking throughout children's book in general. And then in my research, I found that um, about 12% of children's books are um, actually have diverse characters. And I was like, oh my gosh, like only 12%? Like, sheesh, that's like not a lot. Um, most children's books have animals. Um, and then of those 12% that are diverse characters, only like, I think like less than 1% are actually written by diverse authors. 
And so I was like, okay, yeah, we need to do something about this. I want my, I want my godson to be able to see a book that looks like him and that he can relate to and that he can just see himself in it. Um, and then I want all kids to be able to see themselves. So throughout the series, I actually have diverse characters. I have, um, yeah, just different characters so kids can see themselves in the book. Um, but for this book, it's about a little boy, a little girl, their brother and sister, and they are trying to figure out money. So the sister understands it. She is a savvy saver. She loves to put her money away and she's able to do the things that she really wants to do in life. Um, but her brother, Joey, is a little bit of a spender. He spends his money on everything. They get an allowance each week and he's just spend, 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 but he can't reach his goal of wanting to get to STEM camp. And so it's a book about his journey, kind of figuring out, okay, if I want to meet my goals, how do I save for them? Yeah. Um, and it touches on budgeting, goal setting. Um, and then there's like a little activity at the end of the book for uh, any kid to figure out what they want to save for. Oh, that's awesome. When I was a kid, this, this, this might take you back a little bit. Do you, do you remember those scooters that were lifted and had actual tires? They were about four inches off the ground. And instead of like the teeny tiny wheels, like they had like tires on them. Yeah. That was my saving thing. I think it was like 10 or 11 and it was like pink and purple and had fairies on it and it had the handbrake on it. And like, I remember going to Toys R Us and like going with my stepmom and like pricing it out to figure out how much I needed to say for it. And, um, I, I earned a commission. So I had to work for, I had to do chores and whatnot. That's how I, I earned money. And it was in cash. Like this was kind of a little bit before digital banking really started taking off. So I got cash and I remember like saving up, like I had this wad of $1 bills. Like I remember taking my little, I had a little like piggy bank safe and just opening it up. And like, like you just saw this big wad of like 124 $1 bills. And my dad was just like, holy cow. And I went to Toys R Us and I bought that scooter and I was so proud of it. And I took such good care of it because I worked for it. I bought it. I paid for it. I paid the taxes on it too. <laughs> Great. That's awesome. So I think that those stories are, are necessary. Like, I think you have to empower children to make those decisions for themselves. Um, but I think of like all those, like, I look at like the toys that kids get and I'm like, when do they ever remember that? Like you remember that experience because you worked for it, you had your plan. And that was like one thing, for, you know, for your goal. If I look at like all the Christmases and holidays, I cannot, the only like memories I have are like of when we went on a trip and went, you know, explored somewhere new. Um, I do recall my mom getting me these Timberland boots that I wanted for Christmas. But outside of that, like, I can't recall like, any of the gifts that I got, you know? Such a great point. I love that point. Like the things that are given to us that are just like, hey, here you go. There's not that neural tangible attachment to it. Like our brain looks at it differently. Mm -hmm. And it's so much different when you work for something, when you save up, when you have that delayed gratification, when that patience is built in. And right. then- then you get that endorphin rush times 10 or however big it is, because like, that's the reward that you get for doing all that work. Absolutely. Oh, I remember um, a few weeks ago, my mom and I were having a conversation about, I don't know, it was, I don't know what sparked the conversation, but we were talking about um, me taking driver's ed. So in the state that I grew up in, you could be like 15 in 10 months to get your uh, permit. And then you could take it, the driver's ed, like when you're 15 in five months or something like that. And you could also take it in school. And I remember I tried to sign up for it in school, but they were like, oh, you have to wait until the next year. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> no, no, no. Like, <laughs> I this. like, I need to start driving soon. I have a job. Like, I want to start driving as soon as possible. Like, I don't want my parents to say, oh, we're not going to get your car because you don't have your license. Like, I need to make sure I dot all my I's, you know, cross all my T's for this, for this thing. And so I saved, it was like $425 um, to take it at the YMCA. 
and I saved my money. I registered for the class. I took the class over the summer. Um, I was very adamant about getting my driver's license. I didn't want anyone to say that Jasmine couldn't drive. And so I remember my mom was like, do you remember that? And I like had totally forgot about that time. But I, for me, like I recall like every month just putting a little bit towards that, you know, $425 backing it out. So if the summer program was in July, I like started in January and it was just like a little bit of money here and there. So that would grow in order for me to, to get that, um, that program, but I ended up doing it. And like, I feel like, like you said, like that scooter, my driver's permit, like those are things that kids will remember. And those are behaviors that hopefully they will continue into adulthood. Absolutely. Absolutely. What are some of the hurdles? Well, let's discuss hurdles about teaching kids about finances. Yeah. What are some of the things that you've seen? Um, I always hear parents say that they're not good with money. How can they teach their kids? And I, I think, um, or caregivers, I, I find that sometimes adults, we underestimate kids. Kids are so smart. <laughs> they are very intelligent. Like, Kids nowadays are like three or four navigating iPhones and iPads and Kindles and different things. Like they are very, very intelligent. Do not underestimate children. Um, and then also children are very aware of wants versus needs. Like when they ever, they go to their grocery store and you're taking them, they will grab just about every, oh, I want this, I want this, I want, they know, they understand wants. But you say, no, okay, we can't afford that or that's not on the list today. And then you put it back. We only are going to get our needs, right? Those are the things that we need at this moment in time. But they are very capable of um, understanding. I think, uh, I think maybe because of the generations we grew up in and how money maybe wasn't a topic of conversation at the dinner table or just in the household in general, I find that uh, some adults are are not necessarily unwilling. They're just like a little bit of afraid to share. Um, I think it's important for kids to learn from your mistakes and learn um, of the things that didn't work for you. And hopefully that might be something, you know, spark something in them to not do it. Or maybe they will go down that path. Who knows? But maybe they'll go down that path differently. Um, but I think being okay with being honest with your situation, I think being okay with being honest that we don't have, you know, we're not living like this massive you know excessive lifestyle I think being honest about that that's okay um I found for I've actually it's interesting because I know a family who they lived in a very very large house and they actually they didn't downsize they just they moved to um a neighborhood that had just the homes were smaller and the kids are young they're like super young probably under the age of six and they were like complaining about their bedrooms being smaller than their other house and I think that's a great learning opportunity, right? Like we can't live in that house forever. Our job made us move. Um, but don't equate the size of your room to your worth or to um, just what we have. Like just be blessed that you have a room of your own. Like you and your sibling has a room of their own. Um, that's something to be thankful for. But I, yeah, I, I think unfortunately with social media, um, you just have so many people trying to compare themselves. I, I think that's a, a huge challenge that you and I didn't have to face when we were, you know, coming up. Um, we weren't concerned about what Julie was doing on the weekend, it, you know, in her spare time. But now we do have those hurdles of social media and, and kids kind of like comparing themselves. And, and then you have to flex for the gram. And like, those are things that I feel like we just didn't have to deal with that I think parents will have to have honest conversations about where you are financially and and what you want your your kids or um the kids that you're caring for uh to to think about for the future yeah i love that just open honest hey this is where we are not creating a mindset of scarcity such as like I love that example that you get, like when it comes to needs versus wants, Hey, it's just not on the list today versus, um, we can't mm -hmm. because that creates a mindset of scarcity. So wording it in a sense of like, Hey, it's not on the list today that 
doesn't put the 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 child subconscious into that oh survival mindset there's not enough to go around um a lot of things that i see with parents kind of being hesitated hesitating on teaching kids about money exactly what you said like they feel like they don't know or they don't manage their money well um a lot of it i see is guilt or shame there's a lot of guilt and shame around finances. Guilt being, I am a bad person. Guilt being, um, did I say that? Shame is, I am a bad person. Guilt is, I did a bad thing. And they don't want to influence their kids that way. So they just don't talk about it. Like in my household, there were two things that you didn't talk about. You didn't talk about who you voted for. And you didn't talk about money because it was nobody's explicit business, <laughs> explicative business um and then also like it's the practical way on teaching kids about money especially in this digital age where money is not very tangible anymore it's hard to equate reward with numbers on a screen right right for sure i Uh, agree with that yeah so those are all hurdles i've seen on parents teaching their kids about finances um Cash is still a thing, guys. Cash is still amazing. You can still go to this thing called the ATM and withdraw it and be like, here's a dollar for this chore and here's five bucks for this chore. And if you mow the lawn, it's ten dollars, that kind of thing. Um I think but- so I'm I'm into you know digital as well. I have yeah, digital banking. Um I do carry cash for um like for some things, but most things are on my cards. But I do think we underestimate like the power of spreadsheets and just viewing things kind of written out. I still do a um, handwritten budget just so I can understand what's going on. Um, (laughs) I think it's important. I think, you know, you can get lost in the numbers. You can get lost in a spreadsheet, you know, wanting it to equal to zero or whatever. Um, but when you start writing out like, oh, wait, I spent how much money on food or I spent how much money on going out to eat? Um, I think there's something to the power of the pen. I don't know what it is, but <laughs> there is something that for me personally, when I write it out, I'm like, oh, goodness. And then when I talk to other people about it, like, let's actually write this out. They're like, oh, it things aren't, you know, things aren't looking as great as they did on the spreadsheet. Um <laughs> Can I, nerd out, can I nerd out here for a second? Because the first sure. session that I do with all of my clients, and whether they think that budgeting is still a four-letter, four-letter cuss word that starts with a B, or they've been budgeting proficiently for years and they're everyday millionaires. Mm-hmm. Every start of every client, we print off the quick start budget guide from Dave Ramsey, and we fill in on paper, on purpose, all of their expenses, uh, what their plan is, their mission for their money for the month, AKA the budget, because something physiologically happens differently in the brain. When you write down something, it lights up a different part of the brain versus just subconsciously. Oh yeah, my car payment, $700 a month. When you write out that $700 a month car payment or truck payment, it's just like, Oh, this hurts. Right. I don't like this. <laughs> it, it's true. Even like for me, like with planning, um, not necessarily for budgets, but like if I'm doing something, I can put it in my phone all day that I have to do this. But the moment that I actually write it out, for some reason, I want to take action on it. Like I remember it more. I like yesterday I'd been putting off something that I was supposed to do all week. And yesterday I wrote it down and then that evening I actually accomplished it. So, right. Like there is power to handwritten, um, you know, yeah, it's, it's okay. Like I get it. I, I try to put as much as I can on my calendar. Um, but the moment that I write things out for me, it just, it changes things. Um, so I would encourage anyone to write it out you'll be surprised like once you start adding things up like oh shoot netflix hulu disney plus oh my gosh like like tolls parking it just keeps going you're like whoa preach <laughs> it so- I- <laughs> <laughs> love it <Yeah. laughs> so jasmine 
how can people get a hold of your books for their kids? Absolutely. So you can visit www.thewealthplayground.com. Um, we have a bookstore there where you can get all the books as well as some other resources for kids or on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Target, or where books are sold throughout the U.S. I love it. Jasmine, I've truly enjoyed our conversation. I would love to continue for like another four hours, but for the sake of our audience, I think we have to <laughs> leave here for today. Thank you so, so much for the wonderful conversation and for joining me on Tracy's Tuesday Talks. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Tracy. Thank you. And audience, I appreciate you joining us today. Guys, if this conversation struck a chord with you and you would like some help either learning how to teach your kids about finances or you yourself are realizing, hey, I, I too would like to get better with finances, feel free to reach out either direct message or there'll be a link in the um, in the description on how to set up a complimentary financial coaching session. I'd love to meet with you. I'd love to go over your situation, where you are, where you're at, where you'd like to be and how we can get you there. All right, guys. Thanks so much. And I will see you next week.